I'd like to, of course, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, the Cubby Cubby. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners from, from where I hail at the moment, um, the, the Tanong Yalis of Victoria. Thank you. Beautiful. There we go. Thank you. Um, who reads The Guardian? Yeah, did anyone catch the article on Tuesday about Penny Press? No, so in um, classic media style, how to handle Australia's plague of cabbage jumping butterflies was the, um, was the title and I will read from my phone. Gardeners across several states have been taken to social media with images and anecdotes of plague larvae decimating brassica plants and adult butterflies hovering around their gardens. Has anyone noticed that there's more moths, butterflies around this spring than usual? Down in the southern states, they are everywhere. Has anyone wanted to have a hazard a guess why? I'll give you a hint, we're in a climate change session. <laughs> After all the rain? Temperature? Anything from up the back? More cabbage is being grown post-COVID effects. <laughs> According to Dr. Thomas White, an ecologist from the University of Sydney, is the reason for that would be climate. Specifically, a mild winter went, meant more that pupate surviving than usual. There was a very warm start to spring, with days as hot as 40 degrees combined with a few inches of rain, creating ideal butterfly and insect conditions. So there you go. Lots of butterflies because we had a mild winter and, of course, because of climate change. Now, another behaviour that we're seeing with um, some moths and butterflies as well is not only are they increasing in abundance this year, but they're emerging earlier. There's a lot of noise in um, climate records, species records, especially in places like Australia where we have a highly variable climate. But there is a signal in that noise. Behaviours of plants and animals across the country are changing. And the change in these sorts of behaviours is known as phrenology. It's a term that some in this room may be familiar with, um, but essentially it's the behaviours associated with plants and animals, seasonality and environmental factors. So my name is Elizabeth Irvine and I am from Earthwatch Australia. Uh, to Earthwatch Australia, um, we believe in a, side, in a society that lives in balance with nature. So we run citizen science programs that engage communities across Australia, across um, from school all the way through to any age you would like to be and participate, uh, so that people are more engaged, more aware, and have the knowledge and ability to act for climate and our environment. So today I'm speaking about one of our longer standing programs called Climate Watch. And it's an Australian-wide citizen science program developed um, by the Bureau, so the BOM. Apparently I'm not allowed to call it the BOM anymore, but we know that we all love doing it. The University of Melbourne and Earthwatch to measure phenological change in Australian plants and animals due to climate. So studying seasonal behaviours of um, plants and animals is, is nothing new. Of course, we know that traditional owners have been doing it for thousands and thousands of years, and I'll come back to that later. Um, there is, of course, data from countries other than Australia. And one of the longest data sets we have globally, not one of ours, but out of um, Japan, is the first day of um, cherry blossom. This data set goes back for 1,200 years. So what we, this um, was published in the UN report Frontiers in 2002. What you can see is, yes, there's some variability in the first date that there is the first observed spring blossom, obviously culturally very important in Japan. However, in the last 50 years, something has happened. That date has become earlier and earlier and earlier. To the point now, it's significantly early than it ever has been in history. So something's changing there. What this does reflect, though, is that there are changes in climate. However, 
what we know from the data sets that are available across the world is that there's a strong Northern Hemisphere bias, and I think that we all see that within any historical data sets that we use. A lot of the data and the influences that we build from come from a European mindset, if not a Northern Hemisphere mindset. When it comes to phenology, this changes not only how we think about the data, but also the inferences that we draw from it. In the Northern Hemisphere, phenological change is driven by the cold. Land masses in the Northern Hemisphere are typically higher than they are in the Southern Hemisphere. So we have glaciers, we have freezing, we have big changes in day length, and we have that classic four season, four season seasonality. Down here in the Southern Hemisphere, around the latitudes, which include pretty much from Australia up, so maybe not Tasmania, we can leave them off, and maybe the Southern Island of New Zealand, or we can include them, depending on how you feel about them today. We are, of course, driven by temperature globally. We know that with the increases in CO2. But here in the global south, we are also, phenological change is driven by rainfall. And as we move towards the tropics by ENSO variations. So the stronger the variation in the Nina or um, El Nino, the stronger signal that may be displayed by the plants in the tropical regions. So what is Climate Watch? Climate Watch was set up as a citizen science project to help answer the question, what's happening to phenology in Australia? So it's a network of trails and opportunistic spots of 181 climate indicator species across Australia. The idea is to get repeat observations of the same individual um, on the trails or in your local area. And we have in 14 years, developed over 20, have 28,000 registered users. The data is then, once it's spotted, similar to the iNaturalist platform, or you could even consider this to be a precursor to the iNaturalist platform. Our most spotted species is the Australian magpie. Um, of course, it's an iconic species. A key phenological behaviour of the Australian magpie is breeding, and what happens when they breed? They, they swoop. We get a lot of photos of magpies on the ground. We tend not to actually get photos of the magpie swooping for some reason. I'm not sure. I think it's because people are running. <laughs> we validate the data in-house at Earthwatch. We have a community validation feature as well. That data is then sent on to the ALA. So we have a strong data pathway from the citizen science data that's being collected across Australia from the citizens to our program where it's validated and then onto the ALA where it can be accessed by researchers and individuals across Australia and indeed globally. One of the most robust data sets we have developed from the Climate Watch app is actually about our jacaranda as well. And Nadia's up the back there. Nadia, give us a wave. Nadia now works for the Australian Museum but previously was with Earthwatch and released a, published a paper last year about how the jacaranda is changing with climate, particularly the development of iconic bloom. There are a lot of jacarandas in Perth, there's a lot of jacarandas in the street trees in Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, we see them everywhere. Conclusions of the paper, Perth may get and will most likely get too hot for the jacaranda to bloom. It requires that cold phase of vernalisation to stimulate the blooming process. It actually might become more appropriate to Melbourne as a street tree. So there's a real social impact there and how we think about where we live and what we do, not to mention the phenologic and trophic systems that sit on top of that. If our flowers are blooming at the time where it's needed for food, for our birds, our insects, etc., that's fantastic. That's how it's meant to work, right? These are starting to come out of sync. So nature is falling out of sync as things bloom earlier or as butterflies um, emerge sooner as well. We know in Australia, of course, that we have a lot of really highly specialised species and it's these feeding interactions that we're particularly worried about and researchers are looking into these sorts of data sets to find the answer to. So how do we interact with the um, Climate Watch app? Well, you can do it right here. Um, the trails that we have are set up all over Australia and there are actually five, well there's four, hopefully five soon, um, on the Sunshine Coast. So if you've got some spare time this afternoon or if you've got some time tomorrow, you can head down to Karamindi, Dune and Creek, Kiwana Forest, and there's one at the Maroochee Wetlands as well. So if you wanted to head down to there and get in the mangroves. And Jock will, Jock will validate your spots there. Um, we've got some Climate Watch trails set up well within reach of here. So it's an app-based, um, it's a phone-based app. You can get it on um, Android or Apple. 
um, and then you register a user and off you go. So it's quite a intuitive interface to use. Um, anyone who's used iMAT or done this sort of app-based science before will find that it's very familiar. It's about observing the, the particular species and then notating the phenological changes that you're seeing through the prompts. So it has been a 14 year program and what have we learned? Validations are bad. When it comes to collecting data from 28,000 registered users, it does come to one centralised point, which is Earthwatch Australia, where a non-for-profit organisation, our interns do a lot of validating. We did integrate a community validation aspect to the, to the app, a feature to the app. However, we find the uptake on that has been actually relatively low. There hasn't been a significant intake in validation, but we have found that it's actually easier for us as staff to validate. Volunteer retention is, of course, another one. Yes, we may have 28,000 registered users, but we have about 30 who are super users. We're also considering the robustness of the data sets that we've used. So from all of those years of data, we managed to find some great spots about the magpie and huge data set about the magpie, but not much behavioural information. Looking across the data sets, we were able to find that robustness of data for a paper to meet that scientific rigour and standard that we needed from the jacaranda. Not a, na not a native Australian species, but an iconic one that people could easily identify. Also, over the past 14 years, there's been huge change in the way we use our devices. So the UX experience and the um, user expectations have changed rapidly over the time of the 14 years we've had the app. Keeping up with that has been really difficult. And then also maintaining connection to data end use cases. We've had over 220 papers published that we can trace back to the Climate Watch data through various traceability mechanisms where it's directly referenced to where do we trace the data flows from the ALA. How do we then connect with those researchers and say, hey, we're still collecting this data, or hey, how do we collect this data differently? Uh, what did you think about the Climate Watch app? So maintaining those relationships and networks. Um, requires in investment and skill and time. So successes. I think like anything in the not-for-profit world, I think celebrating for going for 14 years is in fact a success. <laughs> we've maintained the core relationships that we've, that have started the project and are still there today in terms of some of the key researchers. The program's actually supported by a scientific advisory panel and we're really blessed to have some great minds on that panel that contribute to the, the back end of the scientific program design for Climate Watch. Another key success is we're now stepping out of Australia to our broader region, into Vanuatu, which is a very exciting program um, funded by the Global Ecosystem Based Adaptation Program through the IUCN. And this is to help our Pacific neighbours integrate traditional knowledge into climate forecasts. So what's happening in Vanuatu is we know that it's receiving an increasingly higher uh, frequency and more extreme cyclonic um, conditions. However, the local communities typically don't listen to the Western forecasts that are broadcast over state media. What, they, what the communities do listen to is their traditional elders and their traditional knowledge. Turtles nest more highly on the banks if there's an early or a severe cyclone season coming. How the turtles know, I'm not sure, but they're very smart. They're turtles, they're higher on the banks. There's something weird that happens with the paolo worm as well. I know that that's one of the species there, the little worm that's quite gross. Um, <laughs> and um, some of the other species that are on the Vanuatu site include, they make you happy just saying them, the mango, the banana, the breadfruit, and three of the turtles. So we are currently rolling out that program in Vanuatu with um, local staff predominantly and communities to find out how is this harness this local knowledge, the local knowledge stays in Vanuatu, it's held there on their traditional knowledge database. The information that is given over is collected on the climate app and it's what they're seeing today in terms of behaviours. Um, and this is one of our most recent spots from Vanuatu, from Vanessa. And she has spotted, and I really have to say this the correct way, the cut nut. 
Um, so we're using that there as a climate indicator species. So again, following out the same program of using the floral indicators as, as potentially some kind of phenological index or indicator, and then comparing that and looking at what the animals and um, other species are doing that may impact, may be indicative of oncoming seasonal forecasts, um, but then also looking at how those ecological webs can indicate each other or may break or fall down. So being able to understand which species may need support given the seasonality. Okay, so what's next? Well, we're hoping to continue the great work that's been happening with Climate Watch. We've got that great supporter base. We roll out to schools, we've got lesson plans. I think we've had over 14,000 14, or 140,000 students engage with the um, with our content in terms of lesson plans. So greater than 140,000 students engage with content. That's all available online. We've listened to the user base, which is, it's a very technical app. For us, it seems like a very, as scientists, it seems like a very straightforward scientific data collection app, but our user base is saying it's too technical. So we've just launched onto INAD as a collector program. So you can, if you don't want to, if you're interested in this, but you can't handle another app and another password, jump onto INAD, you'll find the Climate Watch Collector program that'll run through some of the species there. Um, what's next, also continuing to promote and work through the Vanuatu program. There's been some huge, challenge, huge challenges there, not the least, least of which is going bilingual from English to Vislama to choosing. We've had some great help from experts there in terms of what are the indicator species that we use. How is the best way to roll out something that is highly technically westernised in terms of Western science and integrate that with the traditional knowledge holders? So in closing, I'd just like to reflect on what inspires me about Climate Watch, about the impact of Climate Watch and then in the influence. So what inspires me about Climate Watch is that every day it's the little band of heroes uh, that go out and spot their favourite spots and contribute to this resource. I asked Mar um, Dr Marie Keatley, she's at RMIT in Melbourne now, one of the members of our um, scientific advisory panel, I said, should we keep going with this Marie? And she said, absolutely, it is one of the most recognised phenological data collection networks in the Southern Hemisphere. So keep going. Impact, I think Marie said it. It's the largest phenological data collection project in the Southern Hemisphere. And that's based on citizen science efforts um, from citizens across Australia who may know Earthwatch, who may not know Earthwatch, who may have science backgrounds, or who may not. And that's one of the great things about this um, project is it's high degree of accessibility. And then when it comes to influence, using what we have learned in Australia to support communities in our region that are also um, really at the pointy end of climate change. We've, got, we've received the privilege to be invited to our second um, conference of parties in the Australian delegation to again showcase the app and then to showcase particularly the work that's being done in Vanuatu as a climate resilience and climate preparation method. Um, so it's quite a privileged position to be in, to be involved in an organisation that's been invited to do such a thing. So that's me, that's Climate Watch. A little bit more information up there about how to be involved. Um, it's a program run out of Earthwatch Australia, so we're based down in Melbourne. Um, but it's been wonderful to be here. It's fantastic to be back on the Sunshine Coast and back in Queensland. So I'd just like to express my thanks to the organising committee for putting on such an amazing event. To everyone here who is still here at three o'clock in the afternoon on the closing day, thank you very much. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks for you know, sharing that with us. As you say, a very long-term program and highly recognised. Being invited to COP is fantastic. Uh, any questions? I, I tried to let other people go first, but I was curious if you could share with folks the journey of being in Australia and how you ended up going then to Vanuatu. Like, what were the mechanisms that caused that to happen? Yeah, the main mechanism would be um, Linda Chambers, who is a research ethnology researcher and an original member. She was with the Bureau um, when the program was established and since 
um, moved, stayed with the Bureau, but has since moved from understanding Australian phonology to working quite heavily in um, small island developing states, particularly Vanuatu. And she knew the potential of the project as a traditional knowledge um, and the compatibility with traditional knowledge there for climate resilience and preparedness. So again, this comes down to the people. Very interesting observations about the proliferation of moths and butterflies. Uh, we had a story, just to probably comment more than a question, um, we had a proliferation of moths in Brisbane uh, a year or so ago, and uh, our entomologist friend Don Sands, who was mentioned earlier today, uh, his hypothesis was that it's not so much proliferation as a um, death of their predators out in the, in the inland areas. So there was actually uh, an artificial increase in the population. So sometimes an abundance may not necessarily be a good thing. Yeah, that's so true as well. And it's especially when you're observing in the absence of data, so you're doing your own personal observations, the more you see, the more you see as well. So the more aware you become of something, you see that moth. It's like when you learn a new word, you hear it everywhere. You go, oh, there's a few moths out today. Then you go at the next day, there's still a few moths out today. So, Not enough predators. Not enough predators, yeah. Um, what, the other thing I guess that's important in, in cities too is, is light pollution. And particularly when you've got street trees that, um, they, they found this in Montreal, you know, deciduous trees that are growing next to, to lights, street lights. Uh, not, you know, affecting their phonology. In this occasion, it's their leaf fall and, and budding and so on. Uh, is that anything that you're picking up with some of, you know, are, are any of your sites, do you think, where people are doing observations as citizens, are they near those sorts, are they dealing with those kinds of issues, artificial sources of light or even artificial sources of heat? Uh, or is that something you don't, you can't it's pick up? Extraordinarily good question. <laughs> Um, most of the, the trails in particular are located in nature reserves, so with low levels of light pollution, but people are spotting within their local um, areas, and that can be sort of street trees within their... I'm thinking of jacarandas. Um, yeah, they're jacarandas yeah. Anyway, in Queensland, they're a bit of a pest. They get into our national parks, so we actually don't mind jacarandas not liking the heat. They can go down to Melbourne instead. This one's a, a little tongue-in-cheek for the end of a conference. Is somebody telling the year 12s in Queensland that the, the jacarandas are blooming early? Because teachers for years have told them, if the jacarandas in bloom, it's too late to study. And we may be sending the year 12s into a panic a couple of months early. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with panicking a bunch of year 12s. <laughs> Look, it's a tough year. I mean, they'll, they'll move on. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you.